San Diego's mayor adds $39 million to the city's budget, where the extra funds came from, and what he'd like to spend them on. Coming up. January, I'm considering suicide because I'm in so much pain. I'm asking for relief. The Choice Program is giving me an appointment in March. The VA revamped its system to cut down on how long veterans have to wait for an appointment, but the Vets Choice Program isn't living up to expectations. How Congress and the VA plan to fix it. And grease up that chain. San Diego's annual Bike to Work Day is right around the corner. This is Evening Edition on KPBS. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Maya Trabolsi. San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner has released a revised version of his proposed $3.3 billion budget for the coming fiscal year. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the new spending plan is about $39 million bigger than the mayor's original budget proposed last month. The mayor announced his revised spending plan at the Bay Terrace Community Park in southeastern San Diego. Residents there say for years, city officials have promised them a senior center. The mayor is now proposing an extra $500,000 for that senior center's design. And this is going to be just some of the several additions that we are making in the updated city budget proposal for 2017. This updated budget continues our push to improve communities while still building up the city's reserves to protect neighborhood services in the future. The extra money comes from more optimistic projections for a growing economy. Most of that new revenue would go into the city's reserves. There's also an extra $4.7 million going to address staffing problems at the police department. A city council committee will review the revised budget on Thursday. The council will cast a final vote on the budget in June. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Unfounded bomb threat prompted a security alert at Naval Base San Diego again today. This is the 17th threat found at the Navy installation and two adjacent shipyards since November. The threat messages have all been found inside portable outhouses or on walls of ships. Naval Criminal Investigative Service officials and the shipyards are offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to one or more arrests in the case. It could take up to a month to clean up a spill of diesel fuel into the San Diego River. About 3,700 gallons got spilled in a truck accident last Friday on the Morena Boulevard off-ramp. The site is near a sanctuary that is home to two endangered birds. Audubon Society spokesman Jim Pugh says at this moment it doesn't look like the diesel is spreading into that habitat. Up the river, they've blocked it off. So the diesel can't get past that point. You see there are two, bur uh, two white lines across the river. The spill has closed Friars Road in the west, west end of Mission Valley until the cleanup is finished. County officials say some of the fuel may have seeped into parts of Friars Road and Morena Boulevard. And those roads may have to be dug up. California prosecutors say a Texas company faces four felony counts on dozens of misdemeanors after a pipeline break spilled 140,000 gallons of oil last year on the Santa Barbara coast. Attorney General Kamala Harris said Tuesday that Plains All-American Pipeline faced up to $2.8 million in fines if convicted. Prosecutors say the company faces felony counts for spilling oil in state waters and three dozen misdemeanors for harming wildlife. The company says the spill was an accident. San Diego District Attorney Bonnie Dumana says two local retailers have settled civil charges for illegally selling spice, a synthetic drug that, that's banned in the state. Smoke Zone in Pacific Beach will pay nearly $25,000, and Outer Limits in Oceanside will pay nearly $34,000. Spice overdoses in San Diego have spiked in recent months. Democratic presidential frontrunner Hillary Clinton is looking to blunt the momentum of challenger Bernie Sanders as Democrats head to the polls in Kentucky and Oregon. 
Clinton enters today's primaries with a lead of nearly 300 pledged delegates. She's on track to clinch the nomination in early June, but is trying to avoid a trail of primary defeats that could expose weaknesses before she takes on Donald Trump. California State Treasurer John Chung is stepping into the race for California governor. The Democrat says he's formed a campaign committee for the race that's more than two years away. He joins a potentially crowded field. Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom is running, and former Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa has expressed interest as well. Other potential contenders include former eBay executive and state controller Steve Wesley, billionaire climate activist Tom Steyer, and current Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. The San Diego County Registrar of Voters Office is looking for bilingual speakers for the upcoming primary election. The county needs poll workers for June 7th. Federal law requires the office to have bilingual speakers to help voters who primarily speak Spanish, Filipino, Vietnamese, and Chinese. But the county is also recruiting people who can speak Khmer, Japanese, Korean, and Hindi. Prospective poll workers can apply online at sdvote.com. California's penalty is back on the agenda for the state's Senate and the Assembly Public Safety Committees. The committees are debating two ballot initiatives, one that aims to abolish the state's death penalty and replace it with life in prison with no chance of parole, and another that proposes keeping capital punishment with changes to speed up the process. Lawmakers are considering $150 million in savings for the death penalty is replaced with life in prison. The money saved would go into the general fund, so that would be additional resources that the legislature could then decide how to use those funds. And if the measure to abolish capital punishment passes by a vote of the people, it would apply retroactively to the 700 people currently waiting on death row. A new bill could open the door for California's HIV-positive individuals to receive organ transplants from donors who are also HIV-positive. Current state law bans those with HIV from donating their organs to those in need, but recent studies have deemed the procedure safe. Back in the 1990s, uh, we made it a felony for someone with HIV to donate an organ even if they're donating their organ to someone who's HIV positive. This bill seeks to lift that felony and that, that criminalization so that we can uh, help to relieve a, a portion of the organ pool. Now, the proponents of the bill claim it could shorten the transplant waiting list for those without HIV and save 1,000 patients with HIV each year. The U.S. Senate has passed a $1.1 billion measure to combat the Zika virus in the next couple of years. The amount is nearly $1 billion less than what President Obama proposed three months ago. Zika is expected to spread more widely during the summer mosquito season, but officials say outbreaks in the U.S. are likely to be limited. To date, there have been more than 500 cases of Zika in the continental U.S., all of which so far have been associated with overseas travel. The U.S. government could use some help figuring out exactly what, where mosquitoes that can spread Zika actually are. AP reporter Joshua Plogel says no experience is necessary for what the USDA envisions as a nationwide experiment in citizen science. In America's heartland, unlikely recruits in the fight against right. the Zika virus. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. There might be a couple more people to trickle in here. High school students tasked with keeping tabs on the local mosquito population, especially those that can carry the virus linked to birth defects. Anywhere from a half to a third full is probably good. Science teacher Noah Bush is participating with his students in the U.S. Department of Agriculture's pilot program to update the current official maps of where mosquito species swarm. Not only are they doing great science in my classroom, which is what I want, um, but they're also contributing to a greater cause. Plastic cups serve as homemade mosquito traps that students place across their school districts. I think it's amazing to be a part of, at first I thought this was just like a school project, but it's more, it's much bigger than that. Once the eggs are collected, they are sent to a secured USDA facility where the AP was given exclusive access. These are the egg papers that the students have collected and sent to us. Here, 
the eggs are hatched for confirmation. She's a mosquito larvae. For the data is added to an evolving mosquito map, which shows where disease spreading species exist. And these mosquitoes were used to examine the potential invasion. That's a female Hades albopictus. Lee Konstep says the invasive mosquito project will centralize the data to provide real-time information about hot spots to help researchers and mosquito controllers respond. With little money in state and local government budgets to track the spread of Zika, Konstet says the role of citizen scientists is important. And we need to be prepared. We need to understand the mosquito distributions, make maps, dynamic maps that tell us where mosquitoes are found so we can estimate the risk to humans and animals and protect food security of the United States. So I'm okay with anywhere on this side of the building. And Nearly 100 high schools in 10 states have begun contributing data. Konstead hopes to eventually have 20% of U.S. schools involved. Zika is coming in to the U.S. every day. The CDC says there are nearly 500 cases of Zika currently in the U.S., all travel-related. But scientists say a local transmission is a matter of time. Somebody's going to come in who got infected overseas, is going to have Zika virus in their blood, and they're going to be bitten by a mosquito that can transmit it. Let's see which group does the best, okay? High school students answering the call to help the government figure out the greatest areas of risk. Josh Replogel, the Associated Press, Manhattan, Kansas. Veterans are still waiting too long to see a doctor. This was a problem back in 2014 when the VA came under fire for hiding long wait times at their medical centers. We're finding now that the fix is broken. KPBS is part of a collaboration with NPR and other member stations. Reporter Steve Walsh has been investigating the causes and has this report. Amanda Worth served in the Navy on a destroyer. She got out in 2003. She got sick, a rare tumor that makes it hard to swallow. Music is part of her therapy. She goes to the VA in San Diego, but last fall, when she began having severe headaches, the VA didn't have an opening. I'm dealing with pain on a, on a daily basis, so much so, you know, interrupting my sleep, our quality of life, uh, my ability to function. So the neurology department said, no problem, would you like to be referred out into the community to the choice program? And my instant reaction was, yes, I'm so excited, thank you. Too long a wait at the VA? Choice lets you see a private doctor. Except for Wirtz, it didn't work. After six weeks of migraines and still no appointment, she got a letter from the Choice program. This is February 23rd for an appointment scheduled March 23rd. January, I'm considering suicide because I'm in so much pain. I'm asking for relief. The Choice program is giving me an appointment in March. Veterans Choice is broken. The reasons go back to the beginning, how the VA implemented the choice program and how it was designed in Congress. Ma'am, ma'am, veterans died. Get us the answers, please. That's Chairman Jeff Miller, a Republican from Florida who heads the House Veterans Affairs Committee. He was grilling a VA official back in May of 2014 about the long wait times at VA medical facilities. I spoke with the chairman recently about what happened back then, and I was trying to get a sense of why he and others in Congress were in such a hurry. If you don't think, given the crisis that erupted in 2014, was the appropriate time to stand up a program like Choice, I don't know when you'd find a better time. So Congress moved quickly, maybe too quickly. Chairman Miller introduced the bill in the House on June 7th. By August 7, 2014, President Obama signed the Veterans Access Choice and Accountability Act. The new law gave the VA just 90 days and $10 billion to create a national program that would allow more vets to go outside the VA to see a doctor. On November 5, 2014, the phone lines had to be open so veterans could begin scheduling appointments with doctors outside the VA. So the VA had 90 days. VA officials decided almost immediately that they didn't have enough resources to run the new program themselves. We couldn't. We didn't have the resources or the tools available to us to do that. So after getting little response after hosting an industry day, the VA turned to two companies already doing similar work for the VA, HealthNet and TriWest. The problem was, by the summer of 2014, the VA knew that both companies were struggling with their original contract called Patient-Centered Community Care, or PC3. The VA's own inspector general found pervasive dissatisfaction with the PC3 program 
at several VA hospitals. Eight sites limited their use of the PC3 program, and one facility stopped using TriWest for any services. The VA had to step in to find new doctors for some TriWest patients. Fifty-seven patients were symptomatic for potentially significant conditions, such as cancer, and needed priority scheduling. So why give these companies the new $10 billion choice program? Yahia says they had no choice. No one else would take it. So they signed contracts with HealthNet and TriWest, two companies they knew were struggling. This car wasn't designed to run this race. Um, it had a very different purpose. It had a very different intention. In fact, the PC3 contract, when it was first rolled out, didn't even have primary care. It was only a specialty care contract. So it gives you the scope of this vehicle was not meant to deliver this this vast program. Less than a month later, Congress demanded the whole program be up and running, everything from doctors to call centers, including a call center in San Diego, which is where I first ran into TriWest. And I think everyone looked at it and went, oh my God, you expect us to build networks and to have all these processes in place, all these contact centers, be able to do all these things at a very, very abbreviated schedule. And I think a lot of people went, are you crazy? Frank Mac McGuire showed me around. He's the chief medical officer for TriWest. So yes, are so, we a little, were we crazy? In hindsight, maybe yes, but we're also, we felt like we were up to the challenge. All right. We just want to be given an opportunity to show that it's getting better and it's working. TriWest says it's got things figured out. They have a network of doctors that is now large enough to handle the load. They've worked closely with the VA to solve some of the customer service issues, but it may be too late. Congress and the VA are working right now to change the program dramatically. The VA might take over the customer service job from companies, meaning those new call centers might go away after more than $3 billion has already been spent. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. Support for military coverage is provided by the Patriots Connection, a program of the Rancho Santa Fe Foundation. Mexico's president wants to legalize same-sex marriage in his country. Enrique Peña Nieto says he has already signed initiatives to make the change in the Mexican constitution. Same-sex marriage is already legal in some parts of Mexico, but not all. Del Mar City Hall is on the move. City staff are getting ready to move out of the old brick schoolhouse that has served their city hall since the 1970s to make way for a multi-million dollar upgrade. KPBS North County Bureau reporter Allison St. John says the costs have escalated since the residents weighed in with a bigger vision. Del Mar staff are emptying shelves and packing boxes ready to move next month to temporary offices. The current city hall will be torn down and the plan is to build a new state-of-the-art sustainable city hall. There'll also be a public plaza, a new city TV station and a town hall with roof beams designed to resemble the needles of the area's iconic Torrey Pines. Del Mar City Councilman Don Mosier says this has been a long time coming. The city bought this as a temporary city hall in the 1970s. And the plan was to occupy it for a couple of years and then move to a new city hall. Currently, the Del Mar City Hall is housed in buildings built in the 1920s and the 1950s as school buildings. About two years ago, the Del Mar City Council started seriously considering a new city hall estimated to cost about $8 million. Now, after polling the residents, the project's become much more ambitious and is estimated to cost $16 million. The community is behind building a new city hall. Frankly, these old buildings are an embarrassment. Mosier says even though the project has doubled in price since its conception, the city can afford it. Del Mar is in very good financial shape, much better than most cities. And we have, uh, we're using about half of our financing capacity to, to fund this project. Del Mar has only about 4,000 residents. The median income is a little more than $100,000 a year. Moja says the city has a healthy reserve of $4 million and will not have to raise the sales tax to cover the costs of borrowing for their new city hall. This has been going on for three years, and it's really exciting to get close to the final design and, and to get started on construction because uh, we've had a lot of public input throughout the process. Del Mar will put the project out to bid this summer, so the final cost is yet to be determined. Allison St. John, KPBS News. A San Diego area food company is rolling out a new type of organic label. The marketing technique aims to grow organic farms. Only a small fraction of U.S. farms are classified organic by the FDA. Kashi Foods hopes to change that with a label for farmers who are moving toward organic but aren't quite there.
that period of time in transition, they are not getting paid the price for their, their ingredients or their, their farm products that they would get paid if they were certified organic by the USDA. Today, Kashi produces one cereal with the ingredients from farms moving to organic. The company plans to eventually use these ingredients with its other GMO-free snacks. Overcast and chilly today in San Diego, Molly Cochran says a warming trend will bring some sunshine later this week. That's tonight on the KPBS Weather Report. Well, we have some unsettled weather found across the southwest, and that's going to stay that way through tonight. It's all associated with an area of low pressure in the upper levels of the atmosphere, sparking up some showers and some thunderstorms for Las Vegas and also north of the Phoenix area. But we'll notice mainly clear across California, back towards San Francisco, Fresno, and L.A., and we're also going to be staying rather quiet into the overnight hours. So here's a closer look back home, and we we can just see mainly dry skies. Some of those showers uh, seen farther off to the north and east, and that's really how they're going to stay. Now, we still have a lower cloud base coming in late tonight and sticking around early Wednesday morning, so just a little bit of a marine layer hang, hanging out for the next couple mornings. But by tonight, we'll be relatively quiet, dry oceanside along the immediate coastline back towards Chula Vista with our overnight low of 57 degrees. Then some of those clouds start to creep in for the late overnight hours. Into the middle half of the week we go. This area of low pressure will continue to move on out of the southwest and it's still very dry across California, even San Francisco, back towards LA, San Diego, even Las Vegas clearing out. And our temperatures are going to be a few degrees above average as we head into the middle half of the week. So let's have a look at our extended forecast first starting with the immediate coastline. Notice the low clouds Wednesday and Thursday morning, then some sunshine out for the afternoon. This time of year, our daytime high should be right around 68 degrees. So notice we are a few degrees higher than that Wednesday and Thursday. Still feeling pretty comfortable along the immediate coastline. Sunshine carries on into the upcoming weekend. Farther inland, temperatures also getting into the lower 70s. Some low clouds to start, then some sunshine for the p.m. hours Saturday and Sunday. Temperatures will come back to uh, pretty close to where we should be at for this time of year. Across the mountains, mostly sunny skies, feeling cooler by Friday. Some sunshine remains, though. Temperatures in the 60s, and then we'll fall back into the upper 50s for the start of the weekend. Across the deserts, it'll be in the mid-90s for a Wednesday and Thursday. Definitely feeling rather warm, and then we will have uh, some cooler air move in for Friday. Sunshine going to remain, though, for the end of the week and into the upcoming weekend. Molly Cochran, KPBS News. In a world full of choices, the choice to bike to work is becoming more and more encouraged. That's one of the goals behind the Climate Action Plan that aims to cut the number of car commuting San Diegans from 87 percent down to 50 percent by the year 2035 for people who live within a half mile of transit stops. Now that would mean getting about 17 percent more people on their bikes. The San Diego Association of Governments rallied for Bike to Work Day today to encourage more people to opt for two less wheels and good old-fashioned legwork. I think people let the logistical issues really create a barrier between them and actually committing to it. And when they realize how easy it is, you know, once you think through it and solve it at the beginning of the process, then it becomes so much easier and so much more enjoyable as a way to get to work. And Bike to Work is scheduled for this Friday. Sandag worked with community leaders, businesses, and public agencies to create 101 pit stops throughout the county for participants to pick up free goodies and lots of encouragement. I'm Judy Woodruff. In the next news hour, the growing harassment of Muslim American students in U.S. public schools. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. So summer is just around the corner, and with it, the San Diego County Fair. Mad about the fair is this year's theme, a take on Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Now, the event will feature new foods this year, including the chicken and waffle grilled cheese, hmm, Lord of the Rings hot dog, and some oldies, but goodies, of course, like the deep-fried pizza. Yeah, the fair will be opening June 3rd and continuing through Monday, July 4th. 
And recapping tonight's top stories, Mayor Kevin Faulkner announced his revised spending plan today. The mayor is now proposing an extra 500000 for the design of a senior center in southeastern San Diego. There's also an extra $4.7 million going to address staffing problems at the police department. A city council committee will review the revised budget on Thursday. And it could take up to a month to clean up a spill of diesel fuel into the San Diego River. About 3,700 gallons got spilled in a truck accident last Friday on the Morena Boulevard off-ramp. County officials say some of the fuel may have seeped into parts of Friars Road and Morena Boulevard. And those roads may have to be dug up. And here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. Mexico is on the brink of completing a major transformation of its judicial system. The changes include opening trials to the public. On Morning Edition, the front terrace desk looks at this eight-year effort to stop corruption. And then tomorrow at noon, join us for a live town hall meeting about the major stories this campaign season. It's part of our California Counts election coverage, and you can join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag CA Counts. And as always, you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening. Good night.